Hello and welcome to the Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for March 29th, 2021. Uh, I'm Scott and I work for Adafruit on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed for to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and Circuit Python, consider purchase hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to the URL adafru.it/discord. We hold the meeting in the Circuit Python text channel and the Circuit Python voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, except when it dis coincides with the U.S. holiday. The meeting time has changed. We'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, uh, we can add you to the Circuit Python he says Discord role. Uh, there's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. This meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate. Uh, just add, add stuff to the note stock. Uh, the, meet, the video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, let us know. Uh, there is a note stock to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document, and we'll read them off during the meeting. Uh, the note stock also contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you an option to skip around. A link to the note stock is posted in the CircuitPython text channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest note stock. Uh, this meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, the second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from what we're all up to. Uh, the third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Uh, the fourth part is Status Updates. The Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth part is In the, in the Weeds. Uh, this is the final part as well. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. Um, and next up, uh, we'll get into our first section here, uh, which is community news. I'll take a time code. Uh, so first up and the community news is a big one for the broader open source community. Linux turns 30. Um, so can <laughs> Tux turns 30. Join. Oh, it's Tux turns 30. Uh, join the Linux Foundation as they celebrate 30 years of Linux with social media contests, event celebrations, and more. Uh, there's a link there to the Linux Foundation and Twitter. Uh, next up, uh, the Python Software Foundation membership drive is happening now uh, from the Python Software Foundation. As we celebrate, quote, as we celebrate the PSF's 20th and the Python's 30th anniversaries, we want to welcome everyone to become a PSF member. It's important to us to have a membership that reflects our community. Everyone who uses and supports Python is invited to join us, end quote. There are multiple membership levels available. The me membership drive ends March 21st, 2021. And there's a link there to python.org. And even though it's over, it's never too late to join the PSF. Um, it's uh, still a good organization that's around. And then a few projects from the newsletter. Um, first is a Larson scanner in CircuitPython using PWM on the blue LEDs of the Citroen Maker Pi Pico with a serial connected Adafruit Feather NRF52848 NRF52 Express daughter board providing the PWM audio. Uh, there's a link Thank you, thank you, Foma Guy, for po posting the links. Uh, next project up is uh, experience the joy of receiving your first radio signal with the Scout Makes Bluetooth FM radio kit available on Tindy. And let's see, second to last, we have a colored device that stores all your two-factor 
uh, authentication that types them in for you via Hackaday and Reddit. And last up uh, is the, uh, let's see, emulate, read, write, and communicate between NFC devices with the Electronic Cats's Hunter Cat NFC board, uh, which is, has a super cute cat on the front as well. Um, and that's it for the newsletter, the, uh, or for community news. A reminder, the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a community, CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Um, to contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub at github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter. Uh, there's a drafts folder there that you click and you'll see there should be, you, you use, there's one or two and they're dated, you'll see it. Uh, and you can also do that from uh, GitHub itself using the little pencil icon in the top right uh, to make changes. Uh, if you have topics as well and aren't comfortable making a pull request, you may also tag a tweet with the hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com and we'll get it added. So thank you in advance to everybody who's contributing to that. Uh, next up, uh, we have a new, another section called State of CircuitPython Libraries in Blinka. This is where we take a, an objective statistics view of the parts of the project and uh, as a way to have some, some concrete numbers about how the project's going. Um, so let's get into the numbers. Overall, we had 45 pull requests merged, which seems like a lot, but is actually quite common for us now, which is awesome. Uh, we had 18 different authors, and I'll just, let's pick out a couple names that I think are new. Lucas1337, eHippie, um, Lubarb, and Elsie uh, Congdon are all names that I don't recognize, although they may have come up before. So thank you to all our 18 authors. Uh, next up, I'd like to thank 12 reviewers. Thank you to all those reviewers for, for supporting the authors and getting their changes merged in. Uh, as always, we're, we're trying to always level up people to reviewer level so that we can um, have more authors. So uh, if you're interested in doing more reviews, we have kind of a CircuitPython librarians team that does reviews across all the libraries. And then we also are are able to add people to the core repo as outside contributors if they want to review core stuff. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Uh, we'd love to level you up. Uh, issues wise, overall, we had 22 closed issues by 12 people and 16 opens by 14 people. So we're net down six, which is great. And lots of people are involved, double digits on both of those metrics. So thank you to everyone for uh, participating in CircuitPython. Uh, now let's get into more details. Uh, let's talk about numbers for the core. And I won't I'll, I'll get that. Um, four pull requests merged from three different authors. So thank you to our, auth our authors there. We had five reviewers, which is great. Thank you to all of our reviewers. Uh, we have 23 open pull requests. So we do have quite the number of open stuff. So we should, I say this every week and never do it, but... Um, one way to contribute uh, to CircuitPython core would be to take a look at some of these old pull requests, figure out what was left to do with them, and either suggest closing them or uh, picking them up and finishing them, uh, any outstanding uh, work items there. So that, that would be a huge help. Uh, Issues-wise for the core, we had five closed issues by one person, four open by four people, so we're net down one, which is great. Uh, it doesn't tell me who that one person is, but thank you anyway to uh, who closed those five issues. Um, we have a total of 424 open issues with seven active milestones. Milestones are, are how we prioritize and triage uh, issues as they come in. We have six issues not assigned to milestones, so those are the ones that we're gonna have to take a look at. And um, we have zero open issues for 6XO features, and we have one open issue for 6.2.0. So we're quite close to uh, 6.2 release candidate, I believe. Um, and then we have 42 open issues under the 6XX bug fixes, uh, which is uh, a place we're going to have to take a look at and figure out which one of those we actually want to do. 
Um, so yeah, uh, overall, we're quite close to 6.2 RC. And then depending on when we land the changes that will trigger 7, we'll either do a 6.3 or we'll do a 7. Um, probably 7, given that we want to update Microlab and change the APIs there. So, uh, but even though we'll call it 7, we, we don't really want to, like, cause things to take a long time. So we, 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 the pace that we've had in terms of stable releases is quite good. Um, so we want to keep that up, even if we switch from 6 to 7. Um, okay, and with that, I'll uh, kick it over to Katni for a, an update on the libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and a few extras, including the community bundle. We had 40 pull requests merged across all of those uh, repos, including um, or with uh, 18 authors. And uh, that includes, I think, all the names you listed off from earlier and 11 reviewers. So thank you to everybody involved with that. Um, that leaves us with, I want to say, yeah, 63 open pull requests. Uh, one thing I will say is there are three pull requests that were closed that were 26 days or older, the oldest being 55 days. So that's really great to see. Um, we had 16 issues closed by 12 people and 11 opened by 10 people, leaving us with 311 open issues, five of which are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the circuit, or on the Python side of things, um, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests, open issues, and library infrastructure issues. Um, and basically, you can search the issues by label. If you're looking for something you're new to everything and you're looking for something to do, good first issue is a great place to start. If you're looking for something more complicated, bug or enhancement, is also an excellent um, couple of labels to search. And if you're looking to start reviewing, pick up any one of those open pull requests, take a look at it, check it for syntax, check if you have the hardware, test it, and let us know that you did. Um, that's kind of how most folks get started reviewing uh, the libraries is by commenting on open PRs that you've taken a look at it. And once you've done that and you're comfortable with it, um, we can level you up to reviewer. Uh, we had a number of updated libraries in the last seven days, but no new libraries. Um, overall, I'm glad to see some older PRs uh, being looked into and merged. If you're waiting on us for a PR that you have in, please feel free to ping us and let us know. We're doing our best to keep up with things, but older things often get missed. Um, it's great to see all the continued contributions, especially to the community bundle. And that's where we are with the libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right. Next up, we're going to hear from Melissa about Blinka. Hello, let's see, I lost my place here. <laughs> that happens when I paste all that stuff in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. And this week we had one pull request merged by one author, that's Dan, and one reviewer, that's you, Scott. Um, there are six open pull requests uh, amongst all the Blinka repos. And there was one closed issue by one person and one opened issue by one person, leaving a net of 54 open issues. Uh, you can check those out at github.com slash Adafruit slash Adafruit Blinka slash issues. Um, there were 275 PyPA downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 70 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. All right, uh, next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance for us to take some time and say thank you to folks for doing awesome things within our community. Um, this is done as a round robin, so I will start and then go through the list as sorted in the voice channel. Um, I will be mixing in folks that are either um, text only or not able to make the meeting, so I will read off uh, those as we get to them. And uh, yeah, so Hug Reports, Chance to say thank you. I think that's it. So let me take a time code for myself and I'll get started. Um, first up, uh, Hug Report to Narodoc for s sorting the language names on circuitpython.org. I thought that was awesome. Uh, thanks to Jose David for helping folks on the RP2040 uh, Discord server with CircuitPython. And then last up, uh, thank you to Rob Fenwich for giving me a tip about right-clicking 
in the download list in Firefox to get the original URL, which is something I was struggling with on my stream on Friday. So thank you to those folks. And let me circle around. So from Anic Data, we have a hug report for Brent Rue and Hire Effect for reviews. From Ask Patrick W, uh, they say, uh, thanks to James, uh, Le Samurai Pri for the circuit fix, which reduces the number of HTTP requests to GitHub. Next up from C Grover, uh, group hug to the team and the community. And with that, we're to Dan. Hello. Uh, I'd like to thank Gadgetoid, uh, Fivdi, and Lady Ada who had all contributed to it and had ideas about um, the uh, RP2040 I2C issue in which it didn't work with certain I2C devices. And we have a good fix, it looks like. Um, thanks to KMatch, who's been doing all kinds of work on display IO and vector IO and display related things, both bug fixes and enhancements. That's really great. And thanks to Jeff, who uh, has started working on the IMX added MX port and fixed a bunch of things that were broken and has had a slew of pull requests. It's really wonderful. OK. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. And next up, I have notes from David Gloud, um, who says, Hugger to Tanute for trying to find a solution to the Feather S2 DX pin naming confusion. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, I have work to do there. Uh, hug report to whoever added the random learn link guide, which is learn.adafruit.com slash guide slash random. Hug report to Dan H for solving many people's I squared C issue on the Feather RP2040, number, issue number 4482. Hug report to Foamy Guy and all the watchers of his stream. Hug report to Anic Data for the work and example on the network stack. And lastly, hug report to Jay for C and for the Wii DJ Hero Driver. And next up is Foamy Guy. Alrighty, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, this week, uh, also start off with a hug for Jay Fursian for working on a fix in the TFT Featherwing helper um, to allow it to be used by feathers that have different pinouts. Um, a hug report to James Carr for picking up some work on the Easy Make Oven um, to try to make it use less RAM. I had started down a road and then kind of tricked myself into thinking it wasn't wasn't going to be fruitful, uh, but James picked it up and got us the rest of the way there, and it turned out that it was helpful. Um, so I appreciate that for sure. Um, to Kmatch and Jose David for working on a bunch of new awesome display IO widgets. And then lastly, to Jerry for looking into an issue with the STMPE 610 touch driver. That's all for me. Thanks, Fomi guy. Next up is Hire Effect. Uh, this week, uh, wrong tab. Um, <laughs> No worries. Snuck up on me. My bad. Uh, this week, thanks to Dan for help and discussions uh, about Deep Sleep, the Deep Sleep API last week. Um, thanks to Tio Mitch and Jim Tusak for sticking with their PRs that have been in the review process um, and uh, putting in the required changes for those. Um, thanks to Anic Data for fixing UDP server last week. And uh, thanks to Jeff for uh, his continued fixes on the IMX platform, some of which uh, were issues that I'd had in there for uh, quite a long time, and I'm glad to see those finished. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you. OK, next up, I have notes from Hugo, who says, group hug. Uh, also, hug report to JP and Foamy Guy for the work uh, put into the touch deck project and guide. And a preemptive hug to Katni, who will be publishing her first solo CircuitPython newsletter tomorrow. No doubt she'll rock it. And next up, I have notes from Jepler. He wasn't able to make the meeting, says group hug. Uh, also hug to David Gloud and V923Z. Not sure I thank you for spurring on the work with bitmaps a few weeks ago. And a hug report to Hire Effect and Arturo and others for setting the groundwork for the IMX RT series MCUs. And with that, we'll go to Jerry. Oh, there's the button. Oh, just a, a group hug for me this week. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Yep. Next up, I have notes from Jay Forcine, who says, Hug report to Dan H. and Foamy Guy for PR reviews. Hug report to Foamy Guy and JP for the touch deck learn guide. And 
Tan Newt and Foamy Guy for the streams. Uh, next up from Jose David, we have uh, Hog Report to K Match for reviewing and commenting and all the hard work. Thanks for helping with my lack of geometry skills and come to the rescue. Hug Report to Foamy Guy for all the teamwork. And next up is Katni. All right, so I have a hug report to Jeff for putting in some extra effort into understanding pilot and pre-commit. We still have much to learn. A hug report to Foamy Guy, Jay Matlock, and Kevin J. Walters for submitting PRs to the newsletter this week. To Jerry for dealing with a moderation issue. Uh, sending hugs and support to ET Makers, Bill Binko, and a group hug. Uh, next up is K-Match. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, first off, thanks to Jose David for all the widget and graphics additions. And I put here for your can-do attitude. Don't let anything stand in your way. Keep on moving. That's good. Uh, thanks to Foma Guy and Tan Newt for the live streams. So thanks for putting time into that, especially with us looking over your shoulder. <laughs> and uh, there's a whole lot to learn in, inside of each one of those. Uh, next off to Jeff and Scott. Thanks for encouraging always to try on new things that are sort of outside of outside of the comfort zone. So I appreciate that. And lastly, Warrior of Wire for insights into the Vector I.O. module. And particularly, uh, thank you uh, for your specific defense of pixel refresh speed, as you put it. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, K-Match. Next up is Maker Melissa. I wanted to give a hug to you, Scott, for pointing me in the right direction last week with the bundle release generation. And to Justin for... Uh, help with getting me uh, set up on Amazon S3 and fixing some permission issues. And a group hug to everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, last up, we have notes from Mark, who says, um, Hug report to Tanu for starting me off on Audio Mixer and where to look. Hug report to Kevin J. Walters for pointing out some audio stuff in the PR to confirm it was an existing issue. And group hug. And with that, we're done with Hug Reports. So thank you, everybody, for that. Next up is Status Updates, which is another round robin section. This time, we're taking a minute or two to talk about what we've been working on in the past week, what we plan on working on in the coming week. It's a great way for us to stay in sync about who's doing what and collaborate across projects and give tips and tricks. So uh, that's where we're at. Let me start off after I scroll to my own notes. Uh, so first up. Um, I switched the RP2040 and the generic external flash to NVM TOML, which is a separate TOML format file database for defining flash settings. Uh, just a heads up for anybody doing CircuitPython core development, make sure you init the submodules directory to get the data slash NVM TOML directory in CircuitPython. Um, otherwise, you'll see build errors for the RP2040 that say you're missing the, the cascade TOML root. Um, so that's that's an issue there. And I, I think people sorted it out on the Discord already, but I thought I'd say it here again. Um, this week, I'm kind of intermingling two things. Um, I said finishing up switching the IMX RT to the NVM TOML and CircuitPython and TinyUFD UF2. I have most of that work done. It needs to be tested. Um, but the next big task for me is the BLE workflow, which I think uh, a number of folks are excited about. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm working directly with um, Trevor, who is the iOS dev that Adafruit has um, on the app side. So he's he's got cycles right now, so I need to actually kind of switch to that and get him unblocked. Uh, so my plan is to start stubbing out the, the way that I think the BLE APIs will work. Uh, I'm going to do it from CircuitPython, and that will unblock, unblock Trevor working on the app side of things. So how to do discovery, how to do the file transfer stuff. I'll do that just from CircuitPython to begin with. It won't actually kind of work properly until it's brought into the core. But uh, in the meantime, we can at least, uh, I can stub it out so that all of the app side will be there. Um, and David said, is that going to be iOS only, the BLE workflow? Uh, well, the, the BLE protocol will be openly documented. And we do have an, Ad an Android app dev that we work with. But it will likely be that the Android stuff will come after the iOS because we want to figure out everything that we want to do uh, from the iOS side first. Um, so we, we do plan on bringing it to Android as well. It just won't be quite as quick as the iOS stuff because the iOS stuff is where we'll figure out what we want to do. 
Uh, but the the goal is to be all open about how it all works so that other people can make other apps and, and stuff to work with it as well. Um, Hugo asks, will Beely include desktop support as well? We probably won't do it directly ourselves, although um, the library that I use to stub will, should actually work uh, with Beely Blinka as well, so hopefully. So, you, so you'll be able to programmatically do it, but I don't think we have plans on doing like a desktop app or anything. Um, Somebody else will have to do that. Okay, that we'll talk about this all on my stream on Friday as well. Uh, people are excited. I'm excited. It's going to be exciting. Okay, let's keep going. Or we can talk more in the weeds. Uh, so Seagrover has uh, some notes for us here and says, uh, no CircuitPython activity to report this week, but unrelated, the book illustration project is nearly complete. Have my drawing skills improved and am I having fun? Yes and yes. Are the new skills good enough to put food on the table? Only if drawn there. <laughs> uh, and next up is Dan. Okay. Um, so uh, mostly in the past few days, I guess, um, I've been working, looking at, um, there, was this, there was this problem with the RP2040 where certain I2C devices didn't work. And we found that increasing a certain value fixed it. Somebody, a 50 found it. And it was seemed very empirical. And the question is, is there, was there some better way to do it? And then I think 50 or somebody else also suggested like, well, if we just look at this more carefully, we actually, there's a 300 nanosecond delay that's specified by the ITC specification, which wasn't really there. And this count was moving toward that but it wasn't nearly big enough to actually satisfy the 300 nanosecond delay. So uh, I've now submitted a PR, which has been accepted to our version of the Pico SDK, our fork, that um, calculates the value and makes sure it's 300 nanoseconds. So uh, that's done and it works with all the devices that I could find. And it means this value, which was default one, and then we tried two, and then we tried five. It's actually now 38, hmm. which is fine. Okay, it's what it, where it's supposed to be. The other values are really marginal; like they really just just work. Um, and that's because so, it's based on the core clock speed, right? Yeah, it's based on the core clock speed. So, and the the peripheral has a default value of one, but that default is not a useful default. Right. I think the original thought was that it was useful. I think it wasn't. <laughs> because it depends completely on the clock speed. Right. And each tick is at eight nanoseconds and we're looking for 300. So we need a much larger value. Right. Um, after that fix is incorporated, it looks like maybe with just a couple more like translation PRs and stuff, we should be able to make a 620 release candidate. So I'll be doing that in the next day or two, probably. I have to see exactly what's outstanding and whether there's anything else we really should consider getting in. And Assuming that goes through, we'll have a release candidate zero. We'll see pe more people will try it, hopefully, and then we'll have a stable after that cooks for a while, like maybe at the beginning of next week, like that, um, which will be great. It'll be, include a whole bunch of great changes. Um, after that, as Scott mentioned, we'll try to probably try to move on to a 700, initial work on a se on 700 so that we can make a bunch of incompatible API changes that have been waiting in the wing. And what I'm going to work on for 700, at least to start with, is that we have a lot of pressure from various sources for various projects and capabilities to do dynamic USB descriptors, including HID descriptors, and I'll start working on that. That'll be my main task. OK. Thanks, Dan. Uh, all right, next up, I have notes from David, who says, uh, went on show and tell to show how to piggyback an I2C sensor on a STEM and QT board, which I had not heard, I had not thought of, and I thought it was a really good idea. Uh, portable CO2 sensor with the Feather RP2040 OLED and SCD30 is a Twitter link there. Um, Checking for a friend, the lowest cost bill of material for a school CO2 sensor. Uh, testing an SCD30 plus cutie pie and using color to indicate a level. I made a stripped down version of LED animation to fit the non hackspress cutie pie. Accidentally, quote unquote, discovered the flatulence detector capacity of the sensor, CO the CO2 sensor. 
uh, and tested DJ Hero for the Wii driver. And I'll, uh, I'll link to those. Copy, link, URL, paste. Um, so there's that. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Um, I will start actually with uh, a hard report that I forgot, which was for those I2C stacked up sensors. I did. I thought that was a really, really cool idea as well uh, that David showed on Show and Tell. And I forgot to put a hard report in for that. So big thanks there. Um, for my status reports last week, um, I worked on reviewing PRs for display text and display IO layout. Um, I worked on trying to reduce the memory usage inside the Easy Make project. Um, and I ended up streaming on Friday night, Scott, when you were gone, hmm. uh, just because there were folks around and we wanted to hang out still. Awesome. Um, so that's what I worked on there. And then I also, on Saturday, uh, worked on, uh, dove back into the tiled game map stuff. So I worked on movement, uh, player movement, and collision checking. And then later in the day on Sunday, actually, I worked on um, the camera view to show a subset of the map. So making good progress there. For this week, um, I'll be doing another pass through Display.io library PRs. That's pretty much a weekly thing. I know there's a few out there like Progress Bar and some uh, ones in Display.io layout that have new changes to look at. So I'll be checking those out. And then um, I will be working on the, the custom font guide this week. There's a, a learn guide for custom fonts. And it talks a lot about how to customize fonts and the kinds of things that you would want to customize a font for, but it doesn't show necessarily the most basic example of just how to do it. So I'm going to work on a page for that and also some some more interesting things, like maybe the font awesome stuff that Jeff was playing with at one point. Um, and then the last thing I have is uh, I'm going to keep working on the tiled game stuff. And the, the thing I want to do next is really try to make a more complex, you know, quote unquote, real game that has some more mechanics instead of just a super basic movement thing like I have now to see where my gaps are at uh, and what else I need to implement still. So that's what I'll be up to. Thanks. Uh, yeah. And if you've looked, if you haven't looked at the Celeste uh, Pico 8 version, they they have some of that where it's like certain blocks are like ice or sticky, that sort of thing. Hmm. So you said Celeste? Yeah. I can, I can link you to it. I actually converted it to Python. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Well. I don't think I have seen that. Um, I think it's just celeste.py, yeah. Tanute slash celeste.py is awesome. where that is. And it's based, it, it's got links back to the original source too. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th thank you for working on all that. I, I'm super excited to see you do all this work because I want to do my Game Boy card at some point and hopefully all that stuff will pour it over. Um, okay. Next up is higher effect. Alrighty. Um, I just noticed that Google has an anonymous axolotl character now, and it's adorable. So if you haven't <laughs> seen that, check it out. Um, anyway, uh, this past week, I wrapped up the STM32 uh, low power module, um, with the exception of one remaining bug about returning the correct alarm. But uh, it's otherwise all finished and uh, tested on the Pi board and the Feather F405. Um, Fixed a redundancy in the deep sleep manager in Maine that was uh, kind of calling the alarm system con con constantly in a confusing way. Um, this didn't have a lot of uh, impact if you weren't actively trying to debug problems, but it made things, uh, it, it made program flow really weird uh, if it was. So thanks again for Dan helping to confirm and uh, track that down. Um, I reviewed new changes to the Power API coming in from Jun Desak, who's working on the NRF uh, port for low power. And uh, I put in a PR to try and synchronize the work between uh, those two PRs, the NRF and the STM32 low power, um, that can go in either before or after either of those PRs goes in, but just trying to get the API to be the same uh, going forward. Um, this week, I'm going to get started on the Raspberry Pi 2040 low power system. Um, just, uh, it's going to be my first time working with the RP2040, so I'll be reading through the documentation and just checking out what kind of tools. I've done that a little bit already. Um, I know that it's, it's, uh, got some flexibility in terms of how you approach, uh, clocking, clocking down, uh, for light sleep. Um, and then, uh, pin down this remaining issue with the wake up alarm and get that PR in for final review. And that is it for me. Awesome. Thanks, Hire Effect. And next up, we have Hugo. Uh, 
All right. I should be hearable now, right? Yep. I can hear you. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, last week I was in here. So last two weeks I wrapped up, <clears throat> excuse me, the progress, vertical and horizontal progress bars and the refactor to make Pylint happy with the code. Um, and I looked into an issue that was on the Magtag uh, library regarding a crash loop with a bit, bitmap file, and I wasn't able to reproduce. So um, I'm going to look into it a bit more, but I think it might be something that has since been resolved. Uh, as for this week, I'm going to be looking at other issues that are in the backlog that I can get to, and assuming that FedEx can actually deliver, set up my new PC so that I can be a little more productive. Awesome. That's exciting. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, next up, I have notes from Jeff, who says, last week, uh, spy output on the IMX had some surprises to conquer. I think it's solid now. I found and fixed two problems preventing Adafruit SD card from working with Bitbang IO. Fixed some example code based on feedback in the Learn system. Added some tests to Adafruit Pi PIO ASM, hoping someone else will add more. I fixed a problem with datetime.timedelta.total seconds losing precision. Now long intervals are integer number of seconds, and short intervals can have microseconds. Address feedback on Learn system guides. Ran into an assertion error in the RE module, would cause arbitrary behavior on uh, MCU. Filed a patch with MicroPython, should also PR it to CircuitPython. Uh, ran into a problem with memory view RGB matrix and filed a PR. This week, either moving on to PWM out or moving on to reports that the IMX RT1020 uh, EVK doesn't boot, possibly since 5.3, or bringing up the IMX RT. 1024 EVK, similar to the 1020, but has flash embedded in the microprocessor package. Uh, and then fun stuff, hope to return to en enhancing pulse in to work with longer pulses for one of my own projects. Uh, and with that, I'll head it to Jerry. Hi, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in the last couple of days, I've been able to reproduce this issue that a uh, foamy guy um, found with it, STMPE610 on the Feather RP2040. Um, but I, I can't reproduce it if it's connected to my Mac, I mean, to my to, an, to a Raspberry Pi. I can only reproduce it if it's connected to a Mac, and but not totally reliably. So it's really flaky at this point. So at least now I have something I can try and dig into. Um, but it's, it's pretty confusing. And the uh, just been doing some more playing with it now, and it's getting more confusing. So we'll keep banging away at that. Um, and let's see, the fingerprint library, there was an update. There have been some updates to it recently to add some features to some of the, the newer sensors have some nice new features. But some of the other sensors don't have those features. So there's a little confusion about you know which, which, which now, now uh, commands work and which ones don't. Um, it's not a big deal since not many people know about the new commands yet, so they're not trying to use them. But uh, at some point, we have to figure out a little bit about how to flag the commands, which commands, which uh, which which commands are good for which sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a little issue that trying to debug or understand that one of the new commands for setting a, the system parameters seems to, on the newest sensor, seems to need an extra delay. Don't understand it yet, but still playing with that some more. And actually downloaded and tried the new Mu today, the 1.1.0 beta 3. And for the first time ever, I think it actually works on my Mac. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to Nick Toll for that. <laughs> and uh, my crocuses are blooming. Yay. Yay, springtime. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Yep. Uh, next up from Jay for CN. Uh, added LED on function to Adafruit. Uh, hid dot keyboard to check the status of caps lock, scroll lock, num lock, and compose, uh, and fix the init in TFT Feather Ring 24 and TFT Feather Ring 35 to be able to use the quote unquote non standard non Adafruit Feather boards. Next up, we have notes from Jose David, who says last week, uh, Cartesian widget. Uh, take a brief look at the peripherals Pico registers, not much progress. Uh, PR on the equalizer widget inspired by Ask Patrick W's on the audio mixer. 
Uh, new line error new line arrow function using vector io you can now use it to point things in your screen using CircuitPython added the community bundle a new candlestick class graphical representation of stock market price movement using CircuitPython also added to the community bundle uh, this week styles library and getting this in the widgets library and also a slider widget and next up is katney hello so last week uh, was the first time publishing the newsletter on my own. I still had a lot of help with content um, that went out as expected, uh, which was good. Went through all the other newsletter bits that happen once it's published. Uh, went through a ton of guide feedback. Got it down to items that involve others, uh, as in it's not something that I have enough knowledge to comment or do something about, um, or significant testing is needed. Um, or stuff I don't have hardware for. Uh, there, there's only 12 left, which is good because I think when I started last week, I had 75. Um, published the Cyberdeck bonnet hat and hat guide. Uh, handed off the MIDI Featherwing guide, which is now live um, anyway. Uh, JP finished that off. Um, so that's ready to go and continued on the template quest. So this week, uh, publishing my first entirely solo newsletter. Um, I will be tomorrow proofreading the IoT newsletter for Brent. Um, make sure that that's good to go. Uh, I will be catching up on replies to some older to-dos that I pinged about at the end of last week. There were a number of things in my list that had um, been forgotten, so I pinged about those and got replies on everything. Um, and so I need to follow up on all that. And then continuing to um, work on templates. Uh, have to decide now whether I want to um, do all the templates at once and then go and put them in the guides, or do I want to do one template at a time and put that one template in all the guides? Um, not quite sure what route I want to go on that one. Um, but once I make a decision, then I have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, the basic blank template is done. Um, the next one that's almost done is NeoPixel blank, which is for boards that don't have a little red LED. Um, and then the f one after, it's basically the CircuitPython Essentials Guide. Um, however, we didn't have blank in there um, because blank was part of the CircuitPython, welcome to CircuitPython guide, but everybody needs blank. And we didn't have a real clear um, way of explaining it for every single board. It was sort of generalized and we got a lot of feedback about, hey, my board doesn't have this, my board doesn't have that, doesn't quite work. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're doing this to avoid that, to create a much smoother experience for folks who pick up a board, go to the board guide, and then it will be a tailored list of things that is that looks like every single one was written individually, but the point is it's, it's a template that makes putting it on all the guides a lot easier. That's, the, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right, next up is Kmatch. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So last week, I added a widget uh, flip input, basically an input selector widget. Uh, did a few minor display-related uh, bug fixes. Uh, also helped uh, with some memory usage for quite a few community, or two or three community members, uh, and that'll a discussion for In the Weeds. Uh, this week, uh, I want to review some of the cool widgets coming down the pike, the Cartesian, the progress bar, and the equalizer bar. And the last widget I've got at least partly started is a scrolling text box. Hope I get that in the queue. And then lastly, fun stuff. So I ordered a Teensy 4.1. Been hearing about, a lot about these new chips. So eager to see what you can do with super fast chips. And this one in particular has lots of RAM to use or to fill up. <laughs> and then last, lastly, uh, uh, related is uh, how to get uh, a uh, low cost uh, logic analyzer. So, so Scott and uh, Mark uh, Gamblor have a few few tidbits of, of places to look, so I'll check that out. I'm super excited you're taking a look at it. Thanks. All right, next up is Melissa. Hello. So last week I finished the JSON file generation, uh, which will be used for several things, uh, and it makes it easier to get it makes it easier to get a list of libraries and their dependencies and current versions. 
Uh, I got uh, the dynamic rebundler working, so now you can go to a URL, specify the libraries you want, and it'll rebundle from the main bundle into a, like a little mini bundle on the fly. Um, I started working on getting the existing CircuitPython uh, VS Code plugin figured out, both in terms of usage and internal functionality. Uh, this week, I'm going to get the dynamic rebundler in its final place so people can start using it. Um, and going to help update the CircuitPython VS Code plugin so it has some of the updated functionality of Circup, like the dependency installation. And uh, I'll start on a UI for the... I'll maybe start on a UI for the dynamic rebundler so people can make their own packages easily. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up, I have notes from Mark. It says, last week, Audio Mixer works on RP2040 now and should work on any non-M4 board, but only tested on the RP2040 for now. Other fun stuff. Tomorrow, I survived another trip around the sun. Uh, happy birthday, Mark. Okay, uh, and that's it for status updates. Thank you, everybody. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, the last section we have here today for our CircuitPython Weekly is In the Weeds. Uh, in the Weeds is a chance for us to talk uh, about uh, like whatever we want, basically. <laughs> uh, so this is a chance for any longer form discussions that came up earlier or folks have uh, added during the week. So we have two topics now. If anybody else has topics, please drop those in the notes. Um, and we'll start with Kmatch. Good. Thanks, Scott. So um, just trying to sort of get a pulse on things that are happening in the Discord chat and how best to respond to them. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as we give more tools of folks to use up their memory space, particularly <laughs> with, with displays is what I see, uh, need good ways to sort of uh, help people sort out their problems without having to solve everybody's specific issue. So mm -hmm. I was just looking for inputs on some resources, some of which I just found out when I started posing the question and hunting a little deeper. Um, but what I found were two. One is there's a frequently asked questions for CircuitPython, which has a couple of questions, uh, but it's pretty uh, uh, pretty basic uh, comments. And then it jumps to a super deep dive on MicroPython and a great detailed description on on how to or options there. Um, uh, another resource was Foamy Guy did a good stream this past uh, Friday on the Easy Bake Oven and and basically ways to debug and looking for where the memory gets used up. Uh, but basically just looking for any other uh, good places to point folks to maybe that bridge the gap between the basic and the sort of uh, super deep options. So if you guys had anything else, I'd love to hear it and we can capture it here or, or I can look for another place. But basically, I, I suspect this is going to continue to keep growing in con concerns for folks of running out of memory allocation. And mm -hmm. how can we best help uh, a broad, broad group of folks get what they need? Yeah, I think I think you're spot on saying like we really do need like an intermediate level like guide. Um, like I've done deeper, I've done deep dive streams myself into Circuit Python memory stuff um, using the like JLink GDB capture everything that's happening on the heap sort of things. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't seen those and you're curious, you could take a look at those. Um, there might be yeah, some that, tooling in there that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I think that, you know, having a debugger probably is a pretty small quantity of folks that would have that. So how, how do folks do it, you know, from the rep, not from the REPL, but through print statements or, or whatever. To, mm -hmm. uh, best practices maybe, or basically avenues to hunt down. Uh, and again, like, I think intermediate maybe is the way to way to phrase it people maybe have program experience but not on small computers like this so where to look right we have basically nothing between you know make sure you're using the dot mpy versions of the libraries and here's how you mess with the heap like mm -hmm. there's yeah. there's nothing in between um you you found all the resources we have okay. um so i wouldn't i wouldn't I wouldn't keep digging through learn, I guess is my, okay. is, is just a statement there because I don't think there really is mm -hmm. much of anything else. Um, that said, um, we would 
be absolutely ecstatic to <laughs> have somebody write a guide that fits that sort of intermediate how do you handle memory stuff um i mean we obviously hope that you know with the advent of new boards and so on that we're not running into it but inevitably you're, you're going to use everything up it doesn't matter how much you have of course of course yeah that's the whole point you get more fill it up um <laughs> yeah so um i don't I don't think it's something that is, um, I think it's something, I guess my point is, I think it's something that will continue to be applicable yep. um, and not get lost in the fray um, because I, I think we're starting to see it on bigger boards. Cause initially we were really only seeing it on like the SAMD 21 without flash. Yeah. yeah. And obviously we're still seeing it there, but um, I think we're actually managing to, to, to tank some of the boards with flash now um, and some of the bigger boards um with you know beefier stuff so I, I don't i mean i don't know if that's something you're willing to look into writing up or um just i'm putting it out there for anybody um we we would definitely be happy to to publish something like that i think yeah how about this how about i'll start with putting kind of maybe a bullet list of you know these resources and then maybe a few other tidbits that i'm aware mm -hmm. of and can put find a place to store that and start pointing people that way if it, if that comes yeah. up and then we can can build on it from there that'd be great um you could put it on github okay um because that would also be um a way for folks to collaborate um, yeah exactly on it as make, well. yeah issues comment that'd be good okay i'll i will initiate that all right excellent okay yeah and if anybody has any other pointers even just generic uh non circuit python related things uh feel free to to ping me on discord so I think I, I I think a related topic to this is as we have bigger boards and do library development on the Raspberry Pi, like one thing that we could add that somebody might be interested in tooling is actually a way for us to measure how big libraries are in this in the continuous integration testing. Um so being able to actually catalog the growth or the, the memory footprint of libraries over time. Um, because I think part of the problem that we're seeing is that as we get bigger boards and we develop libraries on those boards, we we bloat them, um, which means that for the smaller boards like SAMD21, they no longer work. Um, and I think in this, like the easy make oven example, I think that is part of where it came up is like the libraries it was using probably bloated a bit over time so i think another another tooling piece that would be good would be a way to just measure the 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 size of libraries themselves uh, as a f once we can measure it then it's a feedback loop as we um as people do pull requests and things like that yeah um so i think that's another tool in our toolbox that we could that we could do for memory um and i think like Anecdata has a, a related question. I think we should just address now. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, Anecdata asks in the doc, uh, is a defragmenter function accessible to CircuitPython a possibility? Um, and there, so CircuitPython has um, GC collect, uh, but it does not do any sort of uh, moving of memory. Um, GC collect simply. Uh, looks through all of the heap and and removes the objects and frees the objects that are freeable um but because of the way that the memory allocations are managed um we don't actually know for sure what what values in memory are pointers into that memory um and so we can't actually change those numbers so we we can't actually do any sort of moving um there's an asterisk there, but like generally we can't move memory. Um, the asterisk is that CircuitPython, not MicroPython, but CircuitPython will do long living, which means that for all of the memory structures related to imports, they get moved to the top end of the heap. And the reason to do that is that it it's assumed that those objects live for a long time. And therefore, densely packing them means that that area of the heap will be densely packed f for the rest of the VM's lifetime. Um, that's not always true, and there's failure, and there's like things that 
um, like you can still allocate and holes there if you if it comes to it. Um, but I think one common misconception is GC collect is now automatically run after import. And then also the misconception with GC collect is that you want to do it after you allocate something big. But I think the better advice is to actually do it before you allocate something big because uh, there's like bounds that the heap looks for free memory in and those bounds get smaller and smaller as um, as you allocate more and more things. And what GC collect does is kind of resets those bounds on the outside. So if you do a GC collect before you allocate, you're more likely to allocate kind of towards the outside and leave the inside to more to larger allocations. Um, so that's a detail, but like, yeah, it's a hard problem. <laughs> um, to be able to do defragmentation, we would have to change the way that the heap works, um, which is not out of the question. Uh, but the reality is, is that hardware wise, we live in this world of Moore's law still, which means that like every year or two, we get a lot more memory, uh, which means that memory use is not the not always the top priority for us to to really optimize so yeah that is my brain up on all of that any other comments around memory okay match i think you're right it, it's definitely something that it would be good to to address yeah and I, I think it's when somebody's formulating their program right they can do some high level things to try and resolve it of course not solve everything Right. So that, that's really what I'm after here. How can you do it at that, you know, when you're when you're coding your Python side? So, right. Yeah, and yeah, I th so I I I think you and Foamy guy and like all the graphics folks are really like pushing those boundaries. So I think you're you're gonna have a better idea yeah. than I than I am actually. Okay. Well, thanks for the input. And again, if anybody has others, yeah. feel free. I see uh, David Glada has a few things in there too. So okay, I appreciate that. Right. Yeah. And so I'll um. I'll just read off what David said for folks who are only listening. David said there was the use by binary advice. There's use binary font, reduce color depth, avoid recursivity. That's probably related to um, pi stack exhaust errors, which is related but different. Um, and then use a generator rather than build a big list. Um, yeah, I think some of it could probably be served by just like being more explicit about what things and how how much memory they take. Like a list has four byte entries, but a byte array has one byte entries, for example. Um, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, Jose David has some comments here that I'll I'll just take a time code since we're kind of through this. So Jose David added related with Kmatch. Um, do we need with functions and patterns are more memory and time consuming in circuit python to avoid using them in libraries and is this architecture dependent um, for example the esp32 s2 bus um, yeah i think um, there are certainly functions and patterns that take more memory um, i think generally they're not architecture dependent um, the caveat with that is that for networking stuff like ESP32 S2 stuff, there's just a lot of memory use kind of to begin with. Um, and Bluetooth has this a bit as well, where like there, when you start these networking stack stacks up, they tend to do a lot of allocations under the hood. So even if you started and you were like, oh, I've got lots and lots of memory, but then you like start up something big and it just takes, takes a lot of memory. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there are general patterns that we could document to be more memory efficient. Um, and having a place to do that would be good. But I think also in general, like it would be good to have it tooled so that we can really measure it well and upfront. Um, because that, that will catch all things that use a lot of memory or a lot more memory than we expected, not just the ones that we're kind of aware of. Um, so yeah, I think that's for the library side. I think really like if somebody wanted to take a look at like 
run CircuitPython and QMU and do an import of the file and do like the GC um, collect sort of thing. And then potentially like once you have that, you could dump all of the heap memory and then you could actually do like the charting that I did um, when I was doing heap stuff. Uh, where you can actually see, like, here's the root object, here's how big it is, and here's how all the things that it points to and how big all, all those things are as well. Um, so I think there's there's some tooling stuff that could, could help alleviate this as well. Okay, anything else? I don't think so. All right, uh, and with that, I will wrap up. I thank you, everyone. Let me just scroll down and make sure I don't forget anything in the wrap up. Um, so this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for March 29th, 2021. Uh, thank you, everyone, who's taken their time to participate. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Uh, the video of this meeting will be, re will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also be featured in the My Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, uh, which you can go to adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to. Just check the Python for Microcontrollers box there. Uh, the next meeting will be held... Let me double check before I say this. Uh, next Monday, April 5th, uh, at the normal time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to, to the URL adafru.it slash discord. Uh, to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And uh, with that, we hope to see you all next week. Uh, have a great week, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Thanks, everyone.